Hello everyone. Welcome to this edition of Indian Sun. Our Prime Minister, Honorable Mr. Narendra Modi, has given us a target, especially to the youth, that we have to work towards a developed India by the 100th Independence Day. Human capital would play a very crucial role in achieving this target. Today we have with us an HR tech and process transformation leader who brings us the HR perspective of the economy, which is education in human resource in, from XLRI and economics from the University of Toronto. He has experienced HR practices along with compensation and benefits at global level. We welcome Mr. Elio Decisa to the studio. Hi Elio, thanks for taking out time for this from your busy schedule. Hi Sachin, thanks for having me. Once we move towards this session, Elliot, I would take you to the HR practices, but before that, I want to have a broader perspective of the economy from you. As our Prime Minister's address in the Independence Day refers to the aspiration of a developed India, you have to compare economic growth with development. So as for you, at what point a given economy like India can be called as a developed economy? Sachin, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, the Honorable Prime Minister in his uh, 75th Independence Day address to the nation did allude to India being a developed economy um, in the next 25 years by its 100th Independence Day. And many people were asking what that really means, right? Um, I think our classical understanding of development is by and large GDP growth. Um, we had some time ago a declaration from the government saying that we would want to be a $5 trillion U.S. GDP economy. Um, this is certainly one indicator of development, but for a nation as diverse, large and complex as ours, it's simply not enough. Um, there are in the economic literature um, several other indicators of economic development, and each of these, um, while covers an aspect of economic development that's important in its own right, does have its own limitations. So my submission to you would be, first and foremost, to treat these indicators as different uh, points or different aspects in a, a bigger picture of economic development. There certainly will be more, and by far this list is not exhaustive, but maybe let's look at some of these different indicators. There's, of course, real GDP per capita, right? And what this means is uh, we look at how much goods and services are actually produced in the economy by taking um, uh, you know, a, a benchmark currency rate. And then we look at how much um, that has grown over time uh, in terms of the distribution um, of, over our population, right? So real GDP per capita looks at how much our economy has grown in terms of real growth in goods and services um, over a period of time distributed over our population. Now, when that's rising, we know that uh, you know overall uh, real wealth is rising, rising, real production is rising, and that's one important indicator. But from a more human standpoint, there are also indicators like uh, the HDI or Human Development Index uh, or the Physical Quality of Life Index (PQLI). Uh, these are both indexes that ultimately result in a rank order of uh, countries across the world that participate uh, in this exercise. Uh, India actually stands quite low in the rankings at this point. Um, our rank at last count was, I think, 134. Um, it's improved over the years, uh, but our HDI rank has really not risen commensurately with uh, you know, our goals and ambitions to be a developed economy. Now, what does HDI actually cover? Uh, it covers several parameters, um, like access to education and services, access to, um, to three meals a day, uh, you know, access to um, to government services and so forth. Um, and all of these um, ultimately are important for a country uh, to call itself developed. Um, other indicators include um, the rate of um, uh, the percentage of our population below the poverty line, uh, typically measured as one um, dollar, even 50 cents a day uh, in terms of uh, in terms of expenditure. Now, uh, as a country, I think we have a large percentage of our population still under the poverty line, over 30%. And you, if you compare that to our typical benchmark in terms of development, which is, let's say, China, a country as large and populous as ours, um, this um, we, don't, we don't compare so favorably. China, for instance, today has less than 2% of its population under the poverty line, uh, under the UN-defined poverty line. 
Um, so this is uh, something that we need to work on um, quite critically. Um, further indicators include the percentage of malnourishment. Now, this is measured, um, you know, typically for children, uh, but even adult malnourishment. Um, and there's a whole science behind this. Um, but, you know, if, if a population is malnourished, then it can't work, it can't think, it can't study, and it cannot contribute to the nation, uh, to nation building into the economy. Um, and uh, finally, there's, of course, the life expectancy at birth or the infant mortality rate, which is typically measured at birth. Um, there are, of course, many cultural factors that have typically dampened the infant mortality rate and its improvement in our cultural context. But it's heartening to see that India's infant mortality rate has significantly dropped, by and large, through communications and campaigns by the government, um, uh, particularly to save the girl child, uh, reduce female infanticide. Um, and overall, life expectancy at birth has significantly improved in the country as access to, uh, to better hospitalization, uh, you know, better nourishment, and uh, et cetera, has, has grown over time. Um, so these, I would say, are maybe four or five different aspects of um, economic development, largely human-focused, but also in the aggregate, uh, looking at real GDP, real growth in, in services uh, and goods over time distributed over the population. Uh, there are, in addition, some predictors we look at uh, that are leading indicators of economic development. One of those is adult literacy. The higher the literacy rate in a, in a population, especially among adults, among the working population, the better the chance that those um, individuals will actually contribute meaningfully, uh, will actually also be meaningful uh, and useful consumers in the economy. Uh, so literacy is important. And I think India has typically fared very well there compared to at least other South Asian nations. You very beautifully kept forward. So uh, before I took your point of human development index, but before moving that, I want to take another point which you talked about malnutrition. So yes, we we have we have traveled from an era when our honorable prime minister that time, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, used to say that when I when I spend one rupee, only nine pesa reaches to the bottom to the actual person. And today we have more than thirty crore Jandhan accounts where the, there were the amount of subsidies and all benefits are directly going to the actual person who should get it. So how this development has helped in this malnutrition over the period of time? And that's a great question. So, you know, direct transfer of subsidies, uh, particularly through the opening of, um, uh, you know, numbers of Jandhan accounts. Um, I've lost track now what the latest number is, but um, has been hugely instrumental in putting um, government expenditure on subsidies um, directly at the last mile, right? Um, we know as a country, we've typically had a problem of middlemen, uh, you know, sucking out the surplus, surplus government um, expenditure particularly. And this has led to the last mile really not reaping the benefits of several government programs. Um, I think with subsidies um, reaching now the last mile much better than they were before, it's still not a perfect system, no doubt, but we can certainly rely on the fact or bank on the fact that more money in the pockets of consumers that need it the most um, will, re will result in, reduce in, in, in reduction in malnourishment. Um, you know, roti, kapra, or makan, uh, I think these are still the most basic needs of this country today. Maybe internet is an important need as well in terms of access. Uh, but those three needs are still timeless. Um, and as long as there's more money in the pockets of uh, people who need these the most, um, you're likely to see that they are spent on these more and this results in, um, in, in, in better nourishment overall. Um, also, I think we must be aware that, um, you know, just the operational aspect um, and then the change in that. Previously, you would have people needing to go, uh, you know, to local politicians uh, to support them with uh, access to government subsidies and programs. Um, you would have tons of these so-called middlemen brokering transfers, ultimately. Um, and this resulted in a huge waste in time and energy with very little reward. Now, when you go to the bank, simply look at what your balance is uh, in your Jandan account, um, and you're able to access that seamlessly through digital payments, for instance. Uh, you know, you don't even need to withdraw money at the ATM necessarily. Um, so all of this has led to a sea change in uh, reducing friction in terms of purchases, in terms of consumption uh, of basic stuff 
uh, basic needs, and this should certainly certainly improve the quality of life and reduce malnutrition. I take your point, uh, Elliot. I'm moving to the uh, human development, you very beautifully kept uh, roti kapla or makan. Now, roti kapla or makan, then now we have to move to the education. How you think that human capital will play a role in GDP growth? I think that's a great question. I think human capital probably, um, you know, uh, perhaps even as much as technology uh, and capital formation uh, has a large role to play in economic development, right? Um, we all know that um, roti, kapra, or makan, when people have that, they can focus on what they need to do. Uh, they become more productive. Um, they become, uh, they're able to study. Um, enhanced literacy rates and enhanced education rates facilitate technological innovations. It's not just the fact that these people create or are more likely to create technological innovations, but they're more likely to be able to serve in the deployment of technological innovations others create. It needs an educated labor force uh, to be able to work in a, in a higher technology environment. So as we move to you know, more higher technology orbits, uh, it's important that we have a labor force that is, that is educated and that will only come once basic needs are served first. Um, now, of course, when you have higher labor productivity and greater technological innovation facilitated by an educated workforce, you have increasing returns to capital. Um, so, you know, whatever investors put into the economy um, is it re reaps higher rewards, essentially. But it's not only that you have higher return to capital transiently, you also have more sustainable growth. Um, you have people that waste less, that understand the importance of using energy uh, carefully uh, or using other natural resources carefully. You have people that are perhaps more likely to understand that uh, you know, moving to more sustainable sources of, of fuel um, is better in the long term for business, not just the planet, right? And all of this not only helps uh, an economy grow uh, and develop, a, a labor force of people, a nation develop, uh, but it helps it do so more sustainably uh, over time. This is, of course, an important aspect of the risk around economic development and growth. Um, and ultimately, when you have sustainable and sustained economic growth, you have poverty alleviation, you have nation building, and you have economic development. Very beautifully kept, Elliot. I think I love the way this conversation is leading. We started with Prime Minister and now we are discussing on the ground level labor force. But we have been a country of uh, license Raj, moving from license Raj to globalization. But still there are different labor codes, different policies related to the labor force. Uh, there is labor mobility and flexibility also. How you think that this this kind of uh, processes, policies, and labor codes contribute to the economic development? I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think this is very often in uh, in our economic discourse and the public often overlooked. Uh, such and uh, so it's important maybe to understand what these concepts entail. So. There's labor mobility and there's labor flexibility, right? So labor mobility is essentially about the sources of labor. It's about their geographic and occupational mobility, um, which is essentially, you know, how easily people uh, are able to move across geographic boundaries, but also across different occupations and different industries. Um, and we'll touch upon this a little bit, um, you know, in, in a second. Uh, but the other aspect, which is labor flexibility, is typically about those who demand uh, or use labor rather than those who supply labor, right? It's about the constraints on them. It's about the constraints um, around hiring uh, and ramping up hiring or easing hiring, for instance, as a very basic, um, uh, you know, consequence of labor flexibility. Um, so I think both labor mobility and flexibility, which are, let's say, two sides of the coin, um, are important to economic development. We all know, for instance, on the mobility side, that the, the Indian companies, particularly in our, you know, in our flagship um, IT industry, which uh, we're known for in the world, uh, is currently facing a huge dearth of skills. But it's not just the IT industry; it's every industry that needs digital or IT skills of any kind, um, right? And when we have a lack of skills, that's that creates friction in productivity and growth. Uh, firms' hiring plans, uh, you know, are, are more protracted. 
um, a lack of skills on on the factory floor or uh, you know in the in the workshop or in the office means work typically proceeds at a slower pace because you have skills bottlenecks. Uh, you have only a few people that have those or don't have those in the required degree. And either you need to outsource that, which means, you know, a bidding and tendering and contracting process, um, uh, you know, or, or other kind of um, lack of easements. And I think flexibility is important in this respect as well. When you create enabling environments, not just for hiring a direct labor force, but even in terms of hiring indirect labor force through contractual arrangements, for instance. Um, and those are, let's say, you know, embedded on the blockchain so people can more easily do their due diligence. Then you reduce friction in productivity and growth for businesses. Um, and, and when you enable um, labor flexibility and mobility, you know, mobility, for instance, through better training, uh, through, you know, reducing barriers to entry. Uh, we know that there are tons of barriers to entry for women, for instance, in different occupations. When you break down all of those and you make skills more fungible, uh, both in their supply and in their in their demand, uh, really, I think you are you 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 enable uh, economic growth and productivity, and ultimately economic development. So it's a range of factors here that needs to be eased from labor law uh, to our education to uh, to several other aspects um, of of governance uh, that will facilitate flexibility and mobility in the labor force, which will ultimately lead to economic development. Thank you, Eliud. Uh, you spoke about China also in the beginning. So if we compare mm -hmm. China with India, uh, only in terms of the low cost labor, we are doing better. Otherwise, ease of doing business, China is better than us. The time taken to register a business, start a business is better than us. Technologically, also, they are better than us. So. Do you think that playing only with the low cost labor will help us or we should focus on other elements now? Absolutely. I think you you just hit it, you know, hit the nail on the head, such an, uh, you know, the ease of doing business is not just about costs. Um, it's ultimately about cost and in some sense, certainty. Uh, you know, when, when um, entrepreneurs uh, or investors feel that uh, the process of securing licenses and starting a business will not be indefinitely protracted when they feel that there wouldn't, there wouldn't be uh, there, there, the chance of tax terrorism, for instance, or retroactive taxation um, is, is nil as long as they've complied with their, uh, with their tax burden regularly and fairly. And uh, when, when several other uncertainties are mitigated, um, you know, I believe you have a conducive environment there then for being uh, you know, a, a place where the world feels, feels that they can do business with you, right? They can come set up shop. And there's no denying that, right? Uh, currently in China, uh, the ease of doing business on any measure uh, is certainly better than, uh, than what we have here in India. That's not to say that we haven't made improvements or strides on our own, but there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, ultimately, this boils down to, you know, how we function as a democracy, as a polity, um, as an economy, as, as a culture, right? I think a lot of that has to do with even even these factors, social cultural factors, uh, not just economic. But I think accounting for these, there are aspects that, um, that, that ultimately build certainty for a business that go beyond cost. Let's talk even a little bit about um, some of the more economic aspects. So we, we've touched upon, let's say, the social cultural aspects, which impact the ease of doing business. But even in the in the classically business aspects, there's productivity and health of uh, of your workforce. Um, you know, you you cannot have a labor force that uh, comes in, um, you know, and then doesn't show up, you know, for five days of uh, uh, you know unplanned leave in a month, right? That's not something that uh, that contributes to your ease of doing business because then you need to hire replacement workers or bodily workforce, uh, okay. a workforce that's low on productivity. Uh, will certainly, as in terms of you know, your return on investment on that workforce, uh, is certainly not going to be a workforce that, uh, that really gives you bang for buck. Um, labor law, which we've talked about already, but even unionization rates um, are other aspects about uh, creating certainty. We, we're seeing, for instance, in the United States, which has a very productive labor force, albeit uh, uh, typically at a much higher cost than countries like China and India, um, and w which is a preferred destination, let's say, for many uh, businesses still um, to run their operations out of, 
uh, for instance, with companies like Amazon, which are some of the world's biggest employers today, um, are suffering because of uh, you know unionization that is, let's say, um, not um, not predictable. Uh, unionization that doesn't work in an environment that is already conducive to giving people, giving workers fair representation and rights. And as a result of that, when um, these labor forces unionize, it's rather seen as a bit of a shock um, to, to um, corporate labor relations. And that results in uncertainty that the business ultimately needs to deal with. Um, so rather than costs, which I think over time will grow for any economy, typically as it becomes, you know, it goes from a, a poor to a middle to a uh, hopefully one day developed economy, costs will certainly rise. Uh, there are other numerous other aspects that build certainty and lend to ease of doing business uh, that need to be focused on. Uh, very beautifully kept forward, uh, Elliot, uh, moving by the Marx theory also. If we go with mm -hmm. unionization and all, it's, it's ultimately required for the benefit of the labor forces. But at the same time, when we talk about more of digitization, more of education, working on education, developing the human capital, the wage inflation plays a very important role. So do you mm. think that wage inflation, particularly to the technological uh, field and sector, has an impact in the uh, labor competitiveness? Oh, it certainly does, uh, Sachin. I think, um, you know, we have been, the IT industry has been the backbone of economic growth and indeed development in the way we have discussed it, um, you know, just a few minutes ago in this country, right? It still contributes to over 30% of our annual GDP. Um, and it's important to understand that the IT industry is a skill-based industry. Uh, it's, of course, labor arbitrage, uh, but it's labor arbitrage that cannot function without the necessary skill set. Um, and the fact that we currently are facing a skills dearth compounded with uh, or by wage inflation uh, I think is a rather daunting challenge uh, for us. And it's one that goes beyond, as I've already said earlier, the IT industry. It impacts every industry where, uh, where you know, IT or digital skills are needed, which is everything in the world today, by and large, in the modern economy. So, you know, and let's just take the example of um, the IT industry itself. Uh, by and large, today, we've gone from calling them BPOs to um, global captive centers or centers of excellence because truly they're not just about business process outsourcing, they're about innovation, they're about, uh, you know, they're about performing more higher cognitive uh, processes. Uh, they're, they're, they become critical differentiators, uh, you know, and assets for um, the big companies in the world. Uh, but they remain so only as lo long as the economic value proposition uh, is still um, in favor of this industry. Uh, and that is being, the foundations of that is being shaken by the rampant wage inflation we've seen, uh, particularly since, uh, you know, the aftermath of COVID, but also beginning before that. And I think it's important to understand why this has come about, right? Um, in our economy, we've seen now a proliferation of startups. We hit a hundred unicorns, um, a billion companies with a billion dollar valuation. Um, just a few months ago. And uh, all of these, you know, the multitude of startups, of course, in our economy, uh, which wh while they serve to, of course, um, solve for a lot of challenges, uh, also increase the competition for the scarce skill set that we have. And so the, the skill scarcity and wage inflation are really two sides of the same coin. Uh, they go hand in hand. Um, and as long as we have this dearth of skills, and there will be a dearth of skills for the time being, because you know the education system uh, only produces so many employable workers every year, and those employable workers are still not workers with domain experience, etc. Uh, we will have um, a, a huge impact on the technology sector in particular, but on our labor competitiveness, particularly uh, for skill sets that um, that are more technology and IT driven. Um, that impact the economy across the board. Now, of course, the solution to that is uh, essentially to ease wage inflation by, you guessed it, uh, a better supply, a more stable supply of the relevant skill set. Um, and let's remember the skill set itself is changing, and it's changing faster than in previous years. Um, there's high, high rates of skill obsolescence, 
um, and emerging skill sets that you know we have very little time to tailor our education system around. Uh, so increasingly, it's going to become about uh, you know finishing schools and tertiary education and self continuing education, uh, which a lot of companies themselves have sensed, uh, but which even we as as a as a government and country need to enable you know, create greater incentives around this continuing education uh, so that we have new skill sets keep pace with uh, change in demand. Very rightly said, uh, Elliot. Also on the employable workforce you touched upon. So if I have mm -hmm. to put it like that, that you have also studied from one of the finest HR colleges in India. Do you think that uh, women participation in the workforce still leads to be done a lot of work particularly in a country like India? Oh, there's no denying it. Um, absolutely. You know, um, during my time at uh, XLRI, uh, which is uh, really a leader in the space of, uh, of, you know, management education, particularly with the focus on human resources, uh, I found that the Institute itself was recognizing that there is a need to have a greater representation in their cohorts of women. And, and why is that, right? I mean, it's not just the fact that you know, almost 50% of this country are women. And when you exclude 50% um, of our population, then you, you know, you heighten, let's say, the acuity of the skills shortage. Uh, it's, it's very clear that that would happen. But, you know, women in the workforce um, are in many ways, um, I think, more beneficial to the economy than men. Now, that's a loaded statement. So let me argue for why that's true, right, at least in my opinion. Um, Women typically, when they become earners in a family, we, we've seen in the economic literature, certainly in this country, but across the globe, that savings rates tend to be higher. So the income that women earn, a higher percentage of that tends to be saved. Now, it's not just true for uh, women that are, let's say, spouses, where the males are also working, and perhaps the males in those, uh, in, in those family units might share a higher burden of household expenditure. That would certainly be a reason why the savings rate in, in, in women's income is higher there. But it's also true that uh, in, in households where women are um, the primary breadwinner or the sole breadwinner, um, or just women are earning by and large for themselves and are not part of the family unit yet, um, we see that savings rates are higher there too compared to uh, average savings rates for men or median savings rates for men. So that's important because when you save more, of course, those savings translate, in, translate into investments in the economy. Now, of course, we have um, consumption expenditure being an important facet of, uh, let's say, GDP as we measure it through the consumption uh, or through the expenditure side of things. But uh, while that's important, a lot of, let's say, non-essential expenditure, what we call discretionary expenditure, doesn't really contribute to economic development in the long term. It might contribute to economic growth in, let's say, a, a one or five year period. Um, and certainly it enhances production uh, or demand for, uh, for goods and services. But long term, it's really savings through enabled through a higher uh, or rather investments rate enabled through a higher savings rates that are channeled into what we what we call capital agglomeration, which ultimately um, results in, uh, you know, higher technology orbits and, uh, and improved uh, economic development. So a higher savings rate, a rate among women, I think, is an important reason why women should be um, women participation in the labor force should be enhanced. Uh, but let's just talk about it from just the business side. So we touched upon, you know, the macroeconomic perspective. That's one aspect: savings rates and investment. But from the business side, you know, many uh, company corporate HR professionals would probably agree with the statement that adjusted for maternity and leave around that, uh, you know, women employees tend to have longer tenure, they tend to stay longer and evince less opportunistic movement and therefore less friction um, for, um, for corporate labor forces than do their male counterparts, um, right? So, you know, we saw, we saw this whole, typically from 2018, 19 onwards, when we had the boom in the software or the startup industry, uh, and of course, software, of course, was booming because, you know, we needed to have Zoom schools, et cetera, in the aftermath of COVID. Uh, we saw that many IT uh, ES um, uh, workers used the opportunity to just jump from company to company. 
Uh, but even as that was happening, we saw that when we separated uh, men and women and we did some kind of basic ANOVA analysis, for example, we found that um, women tended to move much less frequently than men. And of course, this longer tenure is just beneficial um, for, for organizations in the whole. So those are two important reasons. You can give many, many others. Uh, you know, women are just as important a part of this country uh, than, than our men. And if we do not include them um, in economic development, I think both as, as a nation and as, uh, you know, as, um, as, as a government, I think we will have not done our job. Mm, that is the reason government and also the organizations are working a lot on that. Uh, and moving it to the uh, Prime Minister's address to the nation during Independence Day, he spoke about Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan, and Jai Anusandhan. So he is particularly mm -hmm. focusing on innovation. So last week we were discussing with one of the professors. So we we touched upon the what institutions are doing on it. I want to understand from you what the organizations are doing to develop innovations within the organization. Indeed, I think that's a, it's a really great question. Um, you know, I think uh, Anusandhan, which of course is, um, is research, I think is an important aspect. There. I think the PM slogan is right on uh, on the money there. Um, you know, of course, Jav Javan, Jai Kisan, but also Jai Anusandhan will transform this, this nation and this economy, right? Um, I think what organizations are doing increasingly today to put that message into practice is uh, it revolves around the idea of an innovation pipeline. At least the more mature organizations uh, are using the idea of an innovation pipeline um, to, to, to have a structured approach to making sure that um, all ideas are given a fair shot, that they are, um, you know, that they are tested against organizational need and perhaps even beyond organization, let's say the industry or ecosystem level needs. Uh, that they're uh, evaluated appropriately over time and space and that the right organizational resources are allocated to them when they're needed. So what is this idea of the innovation pipeline, right? An innovation pipeline is simply this structured process. Uh, it's typically something that's governed by, uh, you know, by leaders in the organization. Uh, either they might be from the R&D part of the organization or they might even be business leaders, usually some combination. Uh, which brings in uh, business and domain needs and understanding along with an understanding of the technology and the R&D environment, not just in the company, but in the industry and the, the ecosystem. So by ecosystem here, I mean, uh, for instance, the entire um, uh, supply chain, the stakeholders, um, right from uh, an organization's suppliers to its consumers to the environment in which it operates and local stakeholders there to, to the government and investors and shareholders. Right, so uh, these the, the representation of the needs and understanding of these different parts comes together to form uh, the governance around the innovation pipeline. And the innovation pipeline is essentially a process where you start with defining what innovation means for the organization in the context of its ecosystem, aligning that to its various stakeholders' needs, but of course, fundamentally its own needs as an organization, narrowing the focus um, on innovation to let's say two or three core areas um, within the need for the ecosystem, sourcing ideas through usually some kind of competition or, uh, you know, even an open uh, system, a portal online where the ideas are, are documented. Um, let's say, uh, you know, prototypes are, um, are provided and so forth. And then vetting these ideas through, uh, you know, a, a structured rubric um, that applies across the board. So the process of evaluation is fair. And once that happens, of course, the ideas that are selected through this process um, are funded for experiments. Uh, so you, you can have an idea, of course, but it's not really meaningful innovation unless, you know, in its applied sense, it works. Uh, and that's what these experiments are about. So typically these experiments take the form of um, either randomized control trials or treatment and control groups um, that are maybe non-randomized. Uh, so funding and experimentation is an important part of the, of, of demonstrating that selected ideas have merit in the real world. Uh, and then, of course, once the experiments work on a small scale, uh, you kind of pilot business cases in limited environments, right? So it's, it's one way of scaling this up from, you know, a small test bed, a sandbox to the real world. You evaluate it there. And then, of course, once it works in a limited business environment, you scale this up even more 
right? So the scaling process is on a continuum. Uh, but along with scaling, of course, which involves aspects of logistics and funding and evaluation, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you need to sustain this process. Uh, and then, of course, this needs to be rewarding and meaningful and remunerative to those that come up with such ideas, because usually these ideas, the people who come up with them, this is not their, you know, their, their, their real bread and butter. They're working in other jobs, in regular jobs, uh, or they might be piloting multiple innovations. So you need to reward them so that they can focus in the right way on, on innovation that is meaningful to you once you judge that it is. So this idea of the innovation pipeline is typically something that organizations today um, have experimented with and have matured over time. We see different shapes and forms of this. It's been successful to varying degrees. Um, I think a lot of work still remains to be done to um, increase the ROI from this kind of process, but I'm fairly confident that, uh, you know, like institutions today that use a similar kind of, let's say, process to judge what innovations are best for them, uh, organizations too will, um, you know, will refine that. Uh, you, you talked about ROI and all. So do the organization should focus only on, because there would be an innovation which, which would make an economic logic, but there would be innovations which, which would make a process improvement or would not make an economic logic. So should the organization focus only on impact making out of the box innovations or they should focus on innovations as a whole? I think that's a great question. I think innovation takes many forms. Uh, you know, it's um, it's it could be zero to one, creating something from scratch, you know, to use F uh, Peter Thiel's famous distinction, zero to one and one to N. It could be, of course, the one to N where you have incremental innovation. Um, and the end could be very large, or it could be small or incremental. Um, I think ultimately what's meaningful is uh, what an organization can really kind of manage and scale and sustain uh, well. And often in organizations that have established processes, these tend to be the marginal innovations. Uh, it's usually much more difficult to convince stakeholders that, you know, they should, you know, implement some kind of, I don't know, new 3D digital twin based manufacturing, although we see that today in, um, in limited environments and factory floors, uh, than it is to tell them that, you know, one part of the manufacturing process could be optimized. And usually the storyline is um, a smaller innovations build up on, on larger ones, right? So we're seeing that there is, uh, there is capability here uh, that accretes over time. Uh, and let's also understand that innovation uh, can't always be Big Bang. You know, Big Bang innovations, you know, if you were to be a little bit nerdy about this mathematically, typically follow a Gaussian distribution. They kind of come in uh, very, un you know, unpredictably. You know, they arise in, in a manner that you can very rarely, just like black swan events, you know, that affect, affect your risk. Uh, Big Bang innovations are typically rare. Uh, but you can, um, you know, almost willfully and purposefully design and implement incremental innovations. Uh, usually that's what an innovation pipeline typically seeks to source and, and apply. Um, and let's also understand and remember that Big Bang innovations typically ride on the backs of many, many, many incremental innovations. You know, it's rare that you will have a Big Bang innovation succeed uh, without a history of a litany of intervening much, much smaller, much less, uh, you know, fanciful innovations that ultimately, uh, without which the Big Bang innovation might have had a much lower chance of succeeding. So really, I think um, innovation takes many shapes and forms. Um, out of the box thinking um, is, is needed in both cases, I would say, perhaps less out of the box thinking on incremental innovations, perhaps more a combination of deep process understanding and next lie and just using some tried and tested methods to alleviate those uh, but I think out of the box thinking can can impact uh, on both ends of the spectrum um, and ultimately you need both to drive meaningful innovation uh, Elliot you also spoke about human capital development so there has to be a productivity and profitability and growth cycle and also we need to escape that paid income trap so how would you uh, elaborate these two concepts for our audiences? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, productivity, 
profitability growth. Uh, you know, typically in the past, some of the older economic models um, uh, would design or were designed based on an understanding of growth largely accreting from um, more productive labor and capital. Um, today, we found that um, you know some of the best models, and I refer to maybe one. Uh, most recently by the University of Frankfurt and Oxford in 2021, which showed that 20% really, uh, you know, of, um, of economic growth can be attributed to increases in, in profitability. The increase in profit, profitability drives aggregate demand and it drives innovation. Uh, so a good chunk today, at least according to this model um, of economic growth, uh, is coming not just from enhancements in productivity, but enhancements in profitability. Now, what does that mean, right? What does it mean to say that you know productivity and profitability are crucial to economic growth? I mean, we've talked touched upon costs on the one hand, we've touched upon labor productivity and how that enhances, and we saw that those are essentially two sides of the same coin. It's equally true with productivity and profitability. Uh, but profitability, I think, is also about reducing leakages in the system. Uh, you know, I think a, a system as a whole, when it's designed with few leakages, uh, and these leakages can arise due to uh, due to friction in hiring, for instance, or they can they can be deliberate. Let's say, for instance, due to uh, due to retroactive taxation. Uh, these are all drains on profitability, and ultimately, when profitability is hampered, just as when productivity is hampered, you have growth slowing. Now, you alluded to the middle income trap and. Let's talk a little bit about what this um, this means. Uh, you know, the middle income trap is, uh, this has been many, many countries now. Brazil is a famous example, of course, one of the BRICs. So, you know, something here that um, is a good reference point for our country in particular. Uh, it's, it's a situation where middle income countries, you know, failing to transition to a high income uh, economy. Uh, and this is largely due to two, two things. One is rising costs and the second is declining competitiveness. And we talked about this uh, earlier, you know, wage inflation, for instance, in the context of rising costs uh, is, um, is, is a reality for every country that transitions from a low to a middle income country. So what offsets that wage inflation? What offsets these uh, rising costs? Uh, that's the other part here, competitiveness. A country that is high cost in its labor can still be high competitiveness or, uh, or high on competitiveness. Classic example here is the United States, but there are many, many examples in Western Europe uh, and in Scandinavia. Uh, it, it's important to understand the area of competitiveness. So, you know, these are not economies that might be very competitive on, uh, you know, basket weaving, for instance, uh, you know, a highly labor intensive, low technology occupation. But they may be uh, very competitive on designing um, the latest drugs, for instance, for uh, you know, for the next pandemic. Uh, and that's important for us to understand. We need to identify areas of competitiveness where as our, our uh, costs rise, not just of labor, but of doing business across the board, uh, you know, as those rise, um, that we are still competitive there, ideally, or either because we have, uh, you know, a high concentration of the relative of the relevant skills, or we have eased doing business there. We have uh, lower regulatory barriers uh, and a range of other factors. Uh, a middle income trap is a very real um, uh, real phenomenon facing countries like China and India. Uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to mobilize without you know, planning and foresight the breakthrough that we need to go from middle income to high income. And I think it will arise by focusing on the areas of competitiveness um, where, where we can really, as an, we, we have the natural resources, but also we have foresight and design, um, and we can be competitive on the global stage. Um, and this would be the way that we would transition. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, very beautifully put forward. Now, uh, moving forward towards, you spoke about mid-income trap, and now you have been working on compensation structures also. How PM's goal of zero defect would be affected by the, uh, how can be structured through compensation structure? Yeah, I think uh, this is a very interesting uh, question. You know, 
Z, right, as this program is called, I think it was launched by the Ministry of uh, Small and um, Medium, Small and Macro, Micro Enterprises, I'm sorry, uh, so the MSMEs. Um, this was a program called Zero Effect, Zero Defect, or Z, um, and um, it was designed to, you know, substantially um, increase productivity, uh, save energy, use natural resources, um, and uh, enhance environmental consciousness, but ultimately with the view to certifying MSMEs that were compliant with, uh, I think, initially about 50 different parameters, which were later reduced because they were, they were found to be too many, and indeed they were, uh, but ultimately, the idea was to, to, to the certification program, Z certified MSMEs, zero effect, zero defect, um, would be able to expand their market because it would be literally a stamp of um, of trust, uh, you know, of authenticity in their in their production processes, in uh, their sourcing, in their operations, and so forth. And who doesn't want to do business with uh, a company that's low waste um, and optimally uh, and, and operationally optimized, right? Um, so I think this is a very, very important and beneficial program for uh, the multitude of MSMEs out there. I think it's a really, really good initiative uh, by the Ministry of um, MSMEs. And I think what, what we really need to, um, to enable this is to translate this uh, into real incentives. And I don't just mean incentives here for the organization, which there is through the certification and through an, ex an expanded market. Uh, particularly internationally, but for organizations to be to get there, I think they need to incentivize their people and their partners, right? So let's talk about these in in two different um, in two different breaths. So by certifying people or incentivizing people, what we mean is essentially uh, bringing down or cascading these um, targets at the organization level across the several dozen parameters that exist into operational KPIs for people. So example, let's say there is, um, you know, uh, an energy savings target for the organization, for the MSME. This should translate into a KPI, uh, you know, over a reasonable frame of time uh, for let's say admin planning and operations, right? But not just for the organization's employees, also for its partners. This is the other breath where we talk about backward integration of these kinds of targets of these KPIs into the supply chain with, let's say, your partners. So MSMEs also have their suppliers and their partners. Uh, these could translate into, into clauses or KPIs um, within contracts uh, or within the bidding and selection process. Uh, for instance, these could be um, compliance requirements as part of SLAs, service level agreements with these partners. Um, and the way, of course, to incentivize them or disincentivize their lack of adherence would be through, for instance, non-compliance costs, right? We're seeing this increasingly happen um, in, let's say, the um, public sector utility space, powers, power companies in particular, uh, where EPC contractors to these public sector utilities now have non-compliance costs imposed on them if they do not comply with certain standards, um, you know, of, uh, of delivery. Uh, you know, typically project delays or environmental degradation and so forth. I think it's the same idea now here applied to MSMEs, and it can certainly work. Incentivize the MSMEs, uh, but also the MSMEs should be educated and should have the right kind of, uh, you know, of, of KPI designers, both for their people and partners. And then this, these targets will translate into the ecosystem. Uh, and that's where you will have now uh, a program that not just leads to a certification, but to real impact on the ground in the ecosystem for MSNs. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you for this uh, wonderful interaction. Moving from uh, Prime Minister's aspiration for a developed India, which we all have to together work for, to zero effect and zero defect, touching various aspects of human capital development. It was a wonderful, insightful session, and the audiences of Indian Sun will definitely love it. Thank you for your time. I appreciate this uh, conversation, such as it was a real pleasure. Um, I learned a lot from this conversation myself, so thank you for the opportunity. So audiences, that was Elliot Decisa, an HR tech leader for you. Stay tuned with Indian Sun for more insightful sessions. Thank you very much.